Welcome to Funding and Disrupting, the most in-depth business podcast for companies looking to raise money and the investors who fund them. Every episode, we interview a funded founder plus the investor who funded them to get the real story of how it all came together. If you're searching for funding for a disruptive technology or business, or you're searching for the best companies to invest in, then you've come to the right place. This episode of Funding and Disrupting is brought to you by Aura Collective, a leading tech PR and marketing firm. Let's get funding and disrupting. Hello, I'm your host, Keith Herman, and today's VC interview is with Josh Chapman. Josh is the managing partner of Convoy Ventures. He has an impressive career having worked at BlackRock and Morgan Stanley, and he has a passion for eSports. How are you, Josh? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Keith. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to have you. I'm really, this is a topic that I really love. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting into this, but let's start first because you have a really interesting career. You worked early on with BlackRock as an analyst and then moved on to International FC Stone, where you provided M&A services in the natural resources, agricultural and energy sectors. And then you went on to Morgan Stanley, where you were involved in sales and trading for emerging markets such as Africa, the Middle East, Eastern Europe, and Latin America in the institutional equity division that covered hedge funds and asset managers. It's quite, quite, quite impressive. Uh, what I'm interested to find out is how would you collectively describe those experiences working in institutional environments? Absolutely. So. Those experiences taught me a lot about kind of the global capital market structure and how international markets work. How does the private equity market become liquid in the public market? And then how does the public market look at emerging trends? And so from essentially the highest level of, you know, institutional asset management is what I exposure to, you know, while at Morgan Stanley, which got me more interested in getting into venture capital and going a little bit earlier in the life cycle of a company. That journey was definitely taught me a lot in like how the global investment landscape operates, which gives me perspective down here at Seed and Series A investing that I know, you know, just a glimpse of what lies ahead for many of these companies. Now let's, let's talk about the transition to venture capital, because uh, obviously when you're involved in private equity and venture capital are a bit different. So, why don't you talk to us about why the transition to venture capital? Absolutely. So when I was at Morgan Stanley, I saw an opportunity at the fact that there was no institutional asset management around the video gaming industry. There were a couple firms in the world that did it. Now there's well over 15 to 20 firms of what we do. Back in 2016, started looking at this space as the emergence of the way people were spending their time, the way people were spending their money, is increasingly moving from just music and film to interactive media, which video gaming is at the spearhead of. So when I looked at where is a, a gap in the market that I think I could fill, where is a place where I could build my own thing and be an entrepreneur in and of itself of starting a, starting a company, I looked at a VC firm around video gaming, it sounded like a really great idea. And after about three years of kind of a lot of laying the groundwork and hard work, it finally started taking off in 2019 when we launched Fund One. So again, I find this fascinating. You know, how did you get to gaming? I mean, BlackRock yeah. and and Morgan Stanley and EC Stone, right? I'm sorry, SC. It's SC Stone, correct? F FC Stone, but it was a yeah. it was a short stint, so don't worry about it. Okay. Well, I'm just curious. Like, how did you get to the gaming part? Because, like, yeah. You said, I mean, it's like such a niche area and not certainly doesn't come to mind when you think of, of BlackRock and Morgan Stanley. So, yep. yeah, where, where did that happen? <laughs> so I grew up in Asia, Africa, and Latin America growing up. And I grew up a gamer playing either local land parties at my house or at, you know, internet cafes in, in you know, international cities around the world where I, where I grew up. That's actually how... I started the firm with Jason, my brother, and then with Jackson, who's our third partner at the fund. And the three of us 
obviously I've known my brother and we grew up together, but we also met Jackson in middle school. And then again, in high school, while we were growing up overseas, that passion for video gaming continued. I then, you know, decided to go into finance, which was certainly demanding from an hours perspective. And then as a way of kind of de-stressing at the end of the day, I picked up video gaming again, sort of in my mid twenties, as I was looking at just ways to de-stress after the end of the day. So I started playing Halo five guardians and overwatch and uh, a lot of other games. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, wait, is, would there be a way to converge my career in finance and investing with a uh, personal passion? And that essentially was the genesis of what is convoy today. Okay, so let, let's talk more more about Convoy. Why don't you tell us more about your team? You said your brother and Jack. So why don't you tell us more about about them and 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 also what Convoy provides? Absolutely. So we're an early stage venture capital fund focused on investing at the frontier of gaming. That means that we're trying to find the next tech platforms, infrastructure, or even blockchain gaming groups that are building. Uh, in video gaming. So to be specific, this is like trying to find the next Twitch, Skills, Unity, Discord, Unreal Engine, et cetera. We're trying to find the next generation of those, which we think will be a multiple thereof of what we've seen the last 10 years in gaming. Over the last five years, we've added a billion gamers to the market. We've added over 50 billion in revenue to the market. And this you know, industry is now well over five times the size of Hollywood and about over eight times the size of music. And so video gaming is the future of entertainment, which is kind of the core thesis. My partner, Jason and Jack, we started the firm and now we have a principal that works at the firm as well as two associates. So there's six people at the firm. We're actively growing. We're actively hiring. We now have 102 million under management and we're going out to hire more people and to continue to grow the firm. Right. So that's kind of our focus from a stage perspective. You know, we write one to $3 million checks, if not up to $12 million checks into gaming companies. And we're focused on seed and series A primarily, though as the firm continues to grow, we're going to continue to expand our investment criteria. Now, to, let's talk about geography. I'm assuming that you're geographically agnostic. That's correct. Yep. And so let, let's just talk about some of the investments. Just tell us where, where are they located? We have about five to seven investments in Europe. We have one in Africa that we're very excited about, a company called Carry First. We have yet to invest in Latin America, though we've just seen a lot of deal flow down there. I'm very excited to invest in places like Colombia or Brazil or uh, Mexico. A few of these markets I think are very promising. We're heavily invested obviously in the United States, but not any concentration by city. We have two or three in LA, we have two in SF, we have Austin, Oregon, Chicago, New York, Atlanta, they're all over. A few in Canada. And then we just have done a few out in Singapore and then Vietnam. So those are kind of the markets that we've invested in to date. The ones that are not on this list that I've mentioned are places like the Middle East or India or China. Those are really the places that you know, we haven't really, and as well as Korea, South Korea. So those are a few key markets that we're exploring, but we also want to methodically move into, there's no rush. Here. We're going to be doing this for decades, so there's no rush, and we want to make sure we pick the right companies. Your your investments aren't based on geography, though. I mean, you, you see opportunities all no. over the world, and yep. it's really a matter of who has the right project, who has the right team That's right. to execute, right? Okay. That's right. Because um, very often people forget technology is, you know, the teams are decentralized. People are all over the world. A lot of people like to think geographically, but we, we know on the investing side, right? It's where you find the opportunity, which could be anywhere. Absolutely. So, Completely agree. Yeah. So let's, let's talk. I'm really excited to talk about one of your, your investments recently funded called Gino Pets, which is a blockchain based gaming company focused on health and wellness that incorporates NFTs and wearables. And obviously NFTs are on fire, <laughs> which may even be an understatement at the moment. But let, why don't you tell us about Geno Pets and what they have to offer and why it's unique? Absolutely. So Geno Pets is a move to earn blockchain gaming company that incorporates the financial reward for the steps that you take, or if you're going on a run, or if you're walking around, 
the steps you take in a day with currency that you earn in this gaming universe. In this gaming universe, you can then spend that earned currency through physical activity on things like cosmetic items or your Geno pets, which actually is sort of looks like a little dragon. And you can upgrade it, make it stronger, uh, faster, more powerful to win either in, you know, it can be the best looking one. It can be the most powerful one to beat other players. It can have extra abilities. And so as a move to earn a platform within blockchain gaming, it's one of the first, if not the first in the world to really attack this in a very professional way. And this team is fantastic. Jay, Albert, and Ben are just and a pleasure to work with. They're an amazing team. We led their round with Pantera Capital, with Paul over at Pantera, just great groups to co-invest with, to build a company with. And, and I think that, you know, we're just thrilled to be in their corner in one small way for what they're building. Well, it certainly sounds exciting. What is it? Is there a specific aspect that you find most exciting or promising about the platform? You know, I'll tell you the any investment from a VC usually comes down to either a FOMO investing or a, a light bulb moment. And I would like to say that we try to do more the, the latter of the light bulb moment of we get it, of what the founder is trying to build. And then we move with conviction, not because others are moving, but because we believe in this. When I looked at the Genopets, I became super excited about this company because the intersection of people that own crypto and are into crypto, people that watch Twitch and are, are gamers and then also people that enjoy working out at least two to three times a week, like that it, where health is a, at least a moderate concern, if not a higher priority in their lives. And so the intersection of those three, I thought at the start was a very tall order that those were intersecting. After we did some more research, we found out that there was over 11 million people in the United States alone that meet this criteria to a very high degree. And so that was kind of a moment. Also, anecdotally, you know how people compete where they say, oh, I got to get my steps in or, hey, do you want to go on a walk? I want to hit my 5,000 steps or my 10,000 step goal for the day. They're essentially doing two things. One, they're sort of bragging to their friends while simultaneously trying to hit a personal goal on a health perspective. To date, that has not been able to be financially rewarding or to really build anything other than me picking up my phone and showing it to you and sort of being egged on by competition. Well, GenoPets allows for the financial monetization reward and international marketplace liquidity around theft. And that is that has never been done. I think this is going to be larger than Pokemon Go down the road. I think that this is going to be a huge step forward for the connectivity between your physical walking in the real world with financial marketplace and achievement rewards in the metaverse. And that is really the intersection of what GenoPets is doing. Yeah, it's, it's really exciting. I've used for many years platforms that uh, monitor your steps. And, you know, one in particular where they monitor your steps and uh, a portion of a company sponsor you basically, and the funds go to your charity of choice. I've been using that for many years because I, I do a lot of walking and biking daily. So I feel like, why not, right? Let somebody benefit. It's, it's, it's great to tie the two together and incentivizes you. And it's, it's great because it provides something, you know, value to other people. So talk to us about the NFT aspect about it, because obviously that's a super hot area at the moment. Why don't you talk to us about that and, and, and any value you think that that adds to the project? The benefit of the NFT market is that it's providing traceable instant settlement transferability in a global marketplace. That's really the benefit of the NFT markets is that you can, you and I can trade an NFT. And if there's any type of revenue sharing contract, secondary sales fee, that it gets instantaneously settled to the various wallets involved, whether it's our two wallets or, or other wallets. That's kind of the, the foundational premise of what's going on here. We are a huge believer that the biggest and best projects within gaming are going to be ones with utility. So we're an early investor into a company called Axie Infinity with Sky Mavis, and they're one of the largest blockchain gaming companies in the world right now. We are thrilled to be in their corner and we love what they're doing. And they really hit on the fact that ownership transferability, 
and financial reward on things that you own in digital world, like gaming world, is something people want. And Gino Pets is tapping into that by building on Solana, which is a great, great, great group to work with. But the NFT aspect is essentially you can, I can build up my Gino Pet through walking and then I could trade it or sell it to someone else who can take it from there, right? So this is a way that I, if I came into the market and I didn't want to start at Grand Zero, I could buy your Gino Pet that you've been working on for a couple of months and get a head start, uh, but I'll pay you for that. And you might be happy to trade it to me because you would love a hundred dollars or more or much more. These Gino pets on the secondary marketplace are selling for hundreds and thousands of dollars. And so these are, these are very valuable assets that people are assigning value to. And that's kind of the NFT aspect and why we're, we're bullish. But again, there's, there's two types of NFTs, right? There's collectible artwork related NFTs, think CryptoPunks, and then you've got utility NFTs that you can do something with. Truly, you could play with it. You could put it in a world. You could move it around. And we're more bullish on the utility NFTs. How, how exactly did you meet the founders um, of Gino Pets? Yeah, so the, we met the founders through an introduction through one of our LPs. So a lot of our investors in our fund are active in the market. And they heard about this project, sent it over to us, get some thoughts, and then we ended up leading the round. What What was your first interaction with the founders? Let, let, I, let's just talk kind of more on a personal level. Like, what were those discussions like? Yeah. Talking with the founders at the original outset was them pitching the vision of what were the problems? How could gaming solve these problems? And why were they the right people to do it? What we picked up from the founders right off the start was these were some of the, these met the criteria of extremely hardworking, a high level of grit. They had accomplished a lot with very little, which we found impressive. And they really felt it. They felt the vision. They believed in it. This had to exist in the world. And when you feel that from a founder, who is looking at this not as just a profitable venture, which of course we hope it becomes, and everyone does, but this is something that has to be created in the world because it will make people's lives better, right? Anything that gets people, given the unhealthy lifestyles of many people or the more sedentary lifestyles proliferated by technology, Genopets fights against some of those potentially negative trends uh, on people's physical health while connecting it with something fun, exciting, and even financially rewarding. And we picked up on that immediately from the founders on an interpersonal level with them. And sometimes you just wanna, you wanna see them believe it more than anyone. And then those are the easiest founders to start backing. I'm curious about co-investing with, you had mentioned Pantera and I know Dan over there, um, we worked with them for quite some time. And I'm curious, Talk to us about what co-investment looks like. In other words, did you speak with them about and have discussions with the other investors before investing or during the process, or do you just kind of do your own thing? In short, we kind of do our own thing. We want to make up our own mind before talking to other investors, especially on something like blockchain gaming, where we think we have sufficient knowledge and experience to make a decision, yes or no, on, on that company. So we made a decision and then the company told us, hey, another one of the groups at the table is Pantera and we really, really like them because you guys you know, co-lead this round together. And so we were like, absolutely, we would love to, we would love to do that. For me, you know, press releases and co-lead or lead or any of those more ego-driven parts of venture capital don't mean that much to me. What I care about is a great founder, a great company, a fair valuation, and a check size from the venture capital firm that makes sense for our AUM. You check those boxes and all the other stuff can kind of sort itself out. I don't, I don't really, I care a little bit, but not, not enough to ever make a, a big deal out of it. And so we were thrilled to lead the deal with, with Pantera. A ton of other investors co-invested with us as well. I think there were about another 15 to 20 investors-ish. I might have that number slightly wrong, but it was a it was a larger round after after the 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 tail of the tail of investors that joined the round. So yeah, we we made the decision and then we joined the round and we let the company kind of run the allocations of who they want in their company. And of course, we weigh in on hey, we like this 
investor a little bit more than this investor. This investor we've heard not great things about. This investor we've heard amazing things about. We would highly encourage you to you know, include include them over them. And and then the founder makes the decision, and then and then we all work together to make this company and be as helpful to this company to make it a huge success. That's kind of the way we operate. Not every VC operates that way. It's just the way we operate. With regards to the the platform itself, what were some of the subsequent conversations focused on? After the point we decided to invest? No, I'm saying, so you get introduced to, to them and, you know, they tell you, you know, here's what our platform's all about. In terms of being focused on making an investment, what were you, what, what type of questions, you know, did you ask them to, to finally get to the funding finish line? Great question. So we have an extensive Q&A process that we run with every company we invest in, plus multiple uh, full team conversations afterwards, plenty of ad hoc conversations, calling the founder for five minutes to chat through some remaining issue. Some of the key topics that we focus on are where's the product at to date? Where's traction at to date? What's the market size? So with Genopets, it's how big is this crypto gamer athlete market? What you claim this, but how big is it really? And we don't challenge it because we don't believe them. We might just not know. And we need them to tell us as the experts, what, what do we not know? Open our eyes to this a little bit. And they did. And when they do, and then we learn something that's even more fun because you learn something that day that you didn't know the previous. And so market size, product, traction, roadmap is a key part of like, what are you going to do with the capital? How are you going to spend it? What is the milestones you're going to hit over the next 12 months? What's your future plans for capital raising? How are you thinking about hiring? What roles are needed? No team is, is fully complete. That's okay. So how are you going to fill the marketing position or the product position or the engineering position that, that you need to fill? The answers of, I don't know, I'll figure it out after I get funding is the wrong answer. The right answer is, I have a plan. You know, it might, might be tweaked, but this is my plan. What do you, but this is my plan. I've already thought through this. That fills me with confidence that I'm working with a true partner, not a, uh, a person that just wants money to figure itself out. That's, and you can pick up on that pretty quick as a, as a more experienced investor. Now, you had mentioned that internally you have a process of evaluating uh, companies before you make an investment. With regards to Geno Pets, what was it that was, that was the tipping point that you said, oh yeah, this is where we want to do this? The tipping point was when I found out how big the market size was. We had already checked the boxes on, this is an amazing team. So that was a check. We checked the box on their product and their vision and their preparedness. So that was a check. Then we were checking the box on their structure for their tokenomics and their, how they were going to make money. And that was a check. The last two parts were one, believing that the social interaction of people virally sharing Geno Pets with their friends would take off. And then the second part was believing the market size. That I wasn't sure of. I talked with a few friends and I was like asking them, you know, do you count your steps and kind of thinking through that social interaction. And then, then I kind of clicked that, yeah, people are competitive naturally and they want to either show it off or they want to beat their friends or something. And so Geno Pets is that on steroids. So that was a check. And then on the market size, I did, we did some independent research and talked with a, a market research firm that we were speaking with. And I asked them to pull this data and they pulled it and it was over 11 million people in the United States alone. And that, that just kind of blew my mind. And I thought if this imperfect market research is at 11 million, I'm pretty sure the actual number is probably closer to 15 to 20 million. And that's today, much less in 2024, 2026. In a few years from now, when people are proliferating and own Ethereum everywhere and Bitcoin everywhere. And so I think, you know, part of venture capital is seen around corners or trying to see around corners. And I think that with Genopet, that light bulb clicked. And then I came to them and said, we want to lead you around. We want to do this let's rock and roll. And, and we were thrilled to be able to get that over the finish line. So it seems to me that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that between the idea of the utility, 
the tokenomics and the market size and the likelihood for mass adoption. It seemed like it was kind of the perfect storm, correct? Definitely. And then when you get a, those types of great idea and perfect storm mixed with a team that has that amount of hard work and grit and easy to work with, and they're confident, there's a balance between humility and confidence, right? But that, that was just a no brainer. And, and we were very excited to be, you know, a big investor in there around. So how much was the investor? I can't share the details on, on who did what check size, but the round is public at, a, I think it was an $8.3 million round. It was a large round. Yeah. Okay. And, and you were, you and Pantera was, were there just you and Pantera as the anchors? the lead investors or were there other? Yeah. So we, yeah, us and Pantera co-led the round and then a lot of co-investors participated in, in the round at the same, same price. And then there were, you know, a couple of things like private sales and stuff like that. So you had, uh, let's go back. You had mentioned you felt that this could be bigger than Pokemon go. That's a pretty big statement. If I'm even remotely right, then this is, this is incredible. So. Uh, okay. And that is so we, we and okay. So where do you see the mass adoption here? I mean, you know, because this is, this is huge, right? So talk to us about where you see it and how, how fast will it get there? I think over the next two to four years, you're going to see millions and millions of people own a Geno pet or be involved with a Geno pet. The reason why I think it can be larger than Pokemon Go is one, augmented reality with the Pokemon Go experience, it's fun, cool, and gimmicky, but it also forced people to get out and about, walk around, experience the world, and collect something that rewarded them with nothing. So Pokemon Go, people were walking around, building up their collection to, to achieve bragging rights. That was it. That's the whole purpose, right? It's so that I look at, you know, I've got this Charizard or whatever, and this Pokemon that's so cool. And I show it to you on my phone and you go, oh my gosh, I can't believe I haven't gotten that one yet. Where did you get it? That social interaction is what Pokemon Go has provided. In my view, Genopets provides all of that and more, which is financial rewards, a slightly cooler looking user experience and the ability to trade those things with other people. And that, that is, that is a very powerful leap forward in this interaction. Also, I like the Geno pets is not augmented reality. I don't like, I don't think augmented reality is actually here yet in a big way. It's, it's being used, but like mass adoption has not happened for augmented reality and people have been talking about it for over five years now. And Pokemon Go is the only example that is like even remotely done well. Additionally, during COVID, Pokemon Go had the best year of all time, even beating their, their breakout year in 2016, 2017. So during tougher times of the economy, during lockdown, during a lot of things that have been happening in the world, Pokemon Go thrived. I think Genopets is a leap forward and no matter what the world brings, whether it's economic recession, higher interest rates, I think Genopets is structurally sound to be, if not resilient, inverted to any type of economic downturn that happens. So I think Juniper is in short, a leap forward from Pokemon Go. I, it, it sounds like it for, and certainly from what I read as well, I, I agree with you. I think you're going to do really well. I am, um, I am, you know, constantly hearing from technology companies and who are looking for capital. Why don't you share with us your advice? to people that are interested in developing their technology platform. Obviously they need capital, but what should they focus on with regards to their technology before they approach uh, capital sources? I think some of the main parts is, have you thought through a full plan of what it looks like over the next 24 months? And I, I say 24 months specifically because plans of here's what we do in 10 years from now. I mean, that's just, that just means nothing, but 24 months is actionable. That plan would include use of funds, you know, plans on how to build a business development pipeline, whether it's a B2C company or B2B company. I think that we look for founders who have done a lot with a little or a, extremely a lot with a moderate amount. We also look for personal buy-in. If you really believe in this idea, 
don't ask me to fund you before you leave your job. If you really believe in this idea, have you invested personal capital in this idea? And I don't care if that's $100 or $1,000 or whatever you can afford realistically. I want to see buy-in because if you're asking an investor to write hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars into an idea, what have you given up to get it to this point? We get lots of pitches where, well, fund me and then I'll quit my job. And, and unfortunately, that's just not a good start. And I, I can't think of a very successful company right now that that's how it happened. Um, sure, someone could prove me wrong with a few examples there, but that is not the norm. That is the exception. And I choose not to bank on the exception. I choose to bank on things that you know, work and entrepreneurship. Yeah. Those are, those are a few key parts there. Was, yeah. I, I yeah. think maybe, I think maybe the exception there is people who've developed the platform and invested a tremendous amount of their time to develop the, yep. at least to get to a minimum yep. viable product. I mean, cause time, right. Is, has Absolutely. value. Yeah. So yeah, uh, not to diss yeah, it. that. <laughs> yeah, no, of course. That hundred. I, I mean, they may have five hundred thousand dollars of, of their time in it. Great. <laughs> Investing your time is certainly worth a ton, right? Because time, right. time is the what you have to put in. You can't just buy a product and put it on the market. So, what I mean is just what have you personally sacrificed to get it to this point? Because you're asking an investor to also make a sacrifice to yeah. continue to back and. And I think that is a fair ask of either side of the table of, hey, I'm asking, you know, founder saying, I'm asking you to take a risk on my vision. And the investor says, well, I'm asking you to have already taken risks to get to this point. And I don't think that's an unfair exchange. And it actually is a beautiful exchange when it happens well, because then the founder feels very rewarded, validated, and gets to get to the next level and accelerate. And the investor feels like they are so excited to back someone with so much grit that they're just going to win. And that is, that's really powerful. And we've seen that happen a few times now here at the firm. And I couldn't be happier for them to find incredible success. So. Yeah. I, I call it alignment. Once you're traveling in the same direction and you have the same things in, on your mind and working together, it's things happen much quicker and it's certainly an exciting journey. So yeah, so that's terrific. So Let's, let's, why don't you share with me about how the audience can get in touch with you if they're interested in being a part of Convoy Ventures or co-investing or seeking capital. Sorry, can you say that question one more time? So yeah, why don't you tell us if the audience is interested, you know, anyone in the audience listening is interested in maybe getting involved in, with Convoy as maybe an investor, you know, contributing money to, to your investments or even co-investing where they're seeking capital how do they get in touch with you so if you're a founder the best way to get in touch with us is either through linkedin or to apply on our website you can ping any of the groups any of the members of our team on linkedin or you can apply on our website we have a submission form our investment team looks at this every 48 hours now we are absolutely looking at at everything and we'll get back to you what what is and what is the web address it's convoy.bc, so it's K-O-N-V-O-Y.bc. And if you go to that website, you'll see a way to, to submit as a founder. So that's for founders. The second part would be co-investors and other VCs or investment groups that want to you know, invest alongside us. Please reach out. We would love to chat and talk about the space. We actively lead well over 80% of the rounds that we are in. And so we are very often involved in helping founders put together the syndicate and making introductions and stuff and stuff like that. And then if you're also interested in uh, partnering with Convoy in the long term as a potential LP, you can ping us on our website as well or reach out to the partners directly on LinkedIn and we'd be happy to chat. Terrific. Thank you, Josh, uh, for sharing your time and experience today. This is was a great interview. I'll, I'm always excited about the blockchain projects because they're layered technologies. And to me, that's really exciting, taking things to a whole other level which, you know, technology is going to be exponentially greater moving forward because of that. So I'm really happy that you came and, and shared with us. And I want to wish you and everyone at Convoy Ventures the best in your, you know, in all your projects and the future endeavors. Thank you so much, Keith. Really appreciate you having me on the, on the podcast. Terrific. Thanks. 
thank you for joining us on this episode of Funding and Disrupting. Don't forget to visit our sponsor, AuraCo.com, to learn more about working directly with Aura Collective's exclusive technology PR team. They'll help you craft your message, get noticed in the press, and help you get your venture to the funding finish line. Again, you can visit them at www.auraco.com. Keep funding and keep disrupting.